Our first ACMF episode's surreal topic is bargains. Bargains, and specifically Farah and Reese's bargain, play a big role in part one of this book and will continue to be prominent throughout the series. So let's hit the ground running with everything we know about bargains in the Akatar world. Let's start with the basics. What are bargains in the Akatar world? Bargains are an old and strange magic which create a magically binding agreement that demands collection when called upon. We see several variations of bargains throughout the series. For instance, we have the night court bargains where the magically binding bargain is permanently tattooed onto you. Some bargain tattoos show up on both individuals, while with others, it only shows up on one. This is either an author oversight, like where is Reese's matching tattoo from his bargain with Farah, or it represents the power dynamic within the bargain. Reese has the upper hand on what Farah has to do for him, so she's the only one who gets the tattoo. That's just one example. While they do, however, get matching bargain tattoos when they agree to die together. However, this isn't consistent with Nesta and Cassian's matching tattoos, which is more similar to the I'll heal you if you spend a week in the night court with me every month kind of vibe. Nesta and Cassian's bargain, remember, is when Nesta agrees to train if he owes her a favor to be called in at any time. Overall, when the bargain is fulfilled, the tattoo disappears. So it's only permanent until it is fulfilled. And then we have bargains of what Amarantha and Thera agree to under the mountain, where yes, it is still magically binding, But Amarantha leaned on a loophole of her own making when she refused to free Feyre instantaneously after Feyre beat her three trials. This lack of clarity with the bargain is why she was able to refuse to free Feyre, Tamlin, and the Spring Court. On the other hand, the bargain regarding the riddle and being freed instantaneously kicked into action the moment Feyre answered the riddle correctly. Note that Feyre did not get a tattoo from Amarantha's magically binding bargains because that is strictly a night court side effect. Feyre did feel magic sizzle in the air between the two of them, though. I love the idea that the other courts have their own version of a bargain imprinted on them, but that's pure speculation. I should note that Thera and Tamlin made several bargains in book one. However, they weren't magically binding. Despite what we see between Farah and Reese, bargains do not grant the involved a mind-to-mind connection. All this emphasis we get on Farah and Reese's bargain bond is actually masking their mating bond that has snapped into place. Is there still something to this bargain bond, though? Yes, we see that in Thera's second and third trials under the mountain, but I'm willing to bet that was more Reese using his Damati skills in a unique way than the bargain itself because we don't see that same kind of, I'll say, communication with the tattooed bargain any other time. We do get Thera talking to, I'll say, the monsters during the big battle, but I think that is her using her Damati skills, not necessarily the mind-to-mind bond through any kind of bargain that they made. Plus, in Akamath now, Farah is a Damati too, even though she doesn't realize it yet. So their mind-to-mind connection bond is extremely powerful, even for mates. For instance, Cassian and Nesta, while they are mates, they do not have that same mind-to-mind communication within their bond because they are not Damati. Most people, I'll say outside of the night court, really do avoid bargains unless it is absolutely necessary. Even the scholars at the day court don't understand how bargains truly work. Focusing again on the night court bargains, What chooses the tattoo design of a bargain? The magic of the bargain chooses the design. Let's take Reese and Farah's bargain tattoo, you know, from book one, for example. The eye is feline and is almost alive in its own way. Reese, often described as feline himself, influences this tattoo either knowingly or not knowingly. After all, the bargain from his perspective is a way in with her. It also includes intricate depictions of flowers, which probably represent the spring court. So her bargain tattoo reflects both her affiliation with the spring court and the watchful eye the night court has on her. How do you refuse to follow through with a bargain? What happens if you try to not follow through? The short answer is you can't. I imagine the exact nature of how you're unable to defy the bargain depends on the bargain. For instance, when Cassian tries to disobey the bargain between him and Nesta, he physically can't no matter how much he fights against it. And it feels like his bargain tattoo is burning him as well. If you try to not follow through with your end of the bargain, magic will strike you. Like with Farah and Reese's one-week bargain, Tamlin knows the consequences would be bad and put Farah in greater risk 
risk than going with Resand, which again says a lot. That's why he reluctantly agrees to let Thera uphold her end of the bargain. Lucian will explain it in reference to Tamlin as, quote, it will claim his own powers, maybe kill him. Magic is all about balance. It's why he couldn't interfere Farah's bargain with Resand. Even the person who tries to sever the bargain faces consequences. If Tamlin had kept Farah here in the Spring Court, the magic that bound Farah to Reese might have come to claim Tamlin's life as payment for Farah's or the life of someone else that he cared about. Maybe like Lucian. <laughs> <laughs> It would be Lucian. Let's be real. It would be Lucian, yes. Lucian. So we know that you can't defy a bargain. Is there a way out of one? The answer is yes, but it is very difficult. In Reese and Thera's bargain with One Week in the Night Court, it's clear Reese is capable of avoiding it. He even admits how he originally planned to free her of it after one week, but no one else is able to break the bargain. So I'll assume because he is the bargain owner, so to speak, he's the only one with the power to null it. Well, Almost no one else can, because you see, while not even Helian Spell Cleaver can help Tamlin break the bargain, the King of Highburn is indeed powerful enough to do this very difficult task. Plus, he's able to leverage the cauldron's powers, and he has his unholy spellbook. Bottom line, he's an extra powerful motherfucker, and therefore is capable of breaking the bargain, which he will do. But he also thinks he's breaking their mating bond. When the King of Hybern breaks the bargain bond, Thera feels like she's dying and being shredded apart as pain tears through her left arm, where the bargain tattoo is, as well as on her chest, which I'm going to assume is where her mating bond source is, even though the King can't actually break that. She'll describe the void of the bargain feeling like a wasteland within her mind, with their bond concealed beneath it. So... Again, yeah, there is that intertwining there, but ultimately the mating bond is so powerful, it absolutely cannot be broken. While the bargain bond is that surface level there, I'll say like layered over the mating bond as far as, you know, layers go here. I'll be honest, I was working on a list of all the bargains made throughout the series and their accompanying tattoos, but it became surprisingly long. There are a lot of bargains that happen in this series. So I am going to save that rundown for another time and conclude here. We do have five books worth of serial topics to fill. So I think, oh my God. Thank you, Lexi, as always. That was so good. 